welcome to this mask creative health information session. We're just gonna uh, spend a few moments allowing people to join. So bear with us for a few seconds whilst our attendees join us. Hello everybody joining us. Welcome to this Mask Creative Health Information Session. We're going to be starting in just a minute. We're just letting everybody join us and then we'll make a start. Uh, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Helen Chatterjee. I'm a professor of biology here at UCL and I'm the program director for our new mask in creative health. It's really lovely to see lots of people joining us today. Um, I'm joined today by Dr. Thomas Cador. He's one of the other uh, program leads for the mask in creative health. He's also our admissions tutor and we're really, really grateful to be joined today by Alexandra Coulter and she is one of the real leading lights in the whole field of arts, creativity and health. So we're really lucky to have her today. Um, we're going to start this session by telling you a little bit of detail about the programme itself, a little bit about the structure. We're going to be able to share the recording of today, including our slides. We're then going to hear from Alex uh, and her experiences of, uh, she's now the director of our National Centre for Creative Health, which is a key partner for us in this programme. She's also been providing the secretariat and the project lead for the all party parliamentary group for arts, health and wellbeing's creative health report. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, and she's also director of Arts Health Southwest, a leading arts and health organisation. So we're really fortunate to have her with us today. We're then going to have some time to address some of your questions. And um, hopefully you've all been sent the Slido link. Um, if you're not familiar with Slido, just go to the Slido website. You can just uh, look up in your web browser Slido. And if you put in the uh, code hashtag UCLMASC underscore PM, you can post questions there. And I know some of you have been doing that already. You can also vote on questions. So please do post your questions there and have a look at what's already been posted and upvote the ones that you think are most interesting and important. And we'll do our best to get through as many of those as possible. So I'll move on to tell you a little bit more detail about the programme. Um, I'm going to start really by explaining what a mask is, because it's a completely new qualification for us here at UCL and indeed in the world. We're one of the, the world's first universities to set up a new qualification, which leads on from a very successful undergraduate qualification that we've run for 10 years, a BASC. And this is an MASC. So it's not a Masters of Arts. It's not a Masters of Science. It's a Masters in Arts and Sciences. And that really reflects the interdisciplinary focus of the work that we'll be doing in this particular programme, which is focused around creative health. Now, there are many definitions of creative health, and we'd be interested in hearing from you about your own experiences and interests in this field. Within the National Centre for Creative Health, we've been talking about what a, a creative uh, definition would be for this discipline. It's a really new discipline, although the practice has been around for at least 30 or 40 years, I guess, if not longer. But what we like to think of it as creative health is as creating the conditions and opportunities for arts, creativity and culture. I would also include in that other sorts of community assets like nature and the outdoors to be embedded in the health of the public. And what we hope that you'll get out of today is an understanding of what creative health is and why you might be interested in studying creative health at UCL. 
So the programme takes its title from the title of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Arts, Health and Wellbeing's Creative Health Report. If you're not familiar with this report, please do have a look at it. It really is a mine of information and Alex will tell you a little bit more about the, the work of the APPG. This report contains over a thousand different references to peer reviewed research articles, project reports, evaluations and amazing case studies from across the breadth of arts, creativity, heritage, museums and health. And in it, there are 10 recommendations. One of those recommendations is really to embed this notion of creative health, practice, policy and research across areas of education and training. So we're responding directly to one of those recommendations and we're really pleased to work in partnership with the APPG and the new National Centre for Creative Health. We've also been really guided and, and our work is very much underpinned and influenced by health inequality. And we're very much influenced by the work of, the, of Michael Marmot and his team in, in the Institute of Health Equity at UCL. And really because Marmot's work uh, encouraged us to think about these wider social determinants of health. So Marmot's work into health inequalities revealed that a range of social factors need to be taken into account to alleviate health inequalities. And what he said is that the NHS alone cannot reduce health inequalities, social networks, local communities, strongly influence individual health and well-being and I think that's really become more apparent hasn't it as we've uh, gone through and are still going through the COVID-19 pandemic. So what I want to do is spend a few minutes just outlining the programme structure then we'll give you a, a little bit of background in, in terms of the admissions process but please do ask questions if there's any specific topics that you want us to cover in more detail. So our programme, like many taught master's programmes, is worth what's known as 180 credits worth of modules. That means it combines a combination of taught modules and we also have some research modules in there. So there'll be four compulsory modules that all students will undertake. They're 15 credits each. And I'll just tell you a little bit about each of these very briefly. One of these modules is a module that Thomas and I set up and have been running for the past three years. And this is really where we've been testing out some of these ideas of teaching this new way of thinking about health and health inequalities. And within this module, students get a chance to really understand how arts, nature and other community assets interface with health. It's very uh, experiential, so that means students get real opportunity to learn not just the theory uh, and the policy and the practice, but also how they fit together. And actually students get a chance to undergo um, and get a chance to take part in the sorts of activities that we mean when we're talking about, say, an arts intervention or a nature intervention. So you'll get a chance to do a green gym. You'll get a chance to work with, for example, clay or other art making activities. You'll work in a hospital. You'll work in different sorts of settings like museums and arts uh, venues. Another really important module that we're going to ask everybody to do is what's called Approaches to Interdisciplinarity. And this is really where you'll get the background and the conceptual frameworks that help underpin our thinking around creative health. And those new approaches to interdisciplinarity, so how we can draw concepts, theories, ideas uh, and methods from a whole range of different disciplines from across arts, humanities, sciences, medicine and engineering, how we can draw that together to help us understand complex problems like health inequalities and creative health in more detail. Next, we're going to have a program, uh, a project, uh, a, a module related to the lived experience and the notion of co-production. So in this module, public engagement with research, we're going to be working with the lived experience network and many colleagues from that network who already work across teaching and research and practice and policy. And they're going to come in and share their experiences. And this is very much about working together to understand the dynamics of how the lived experience, how participation and co-production can be better embedded in research research. And then finally, the all important research methods. So those skills and practical experiences that you really need to have uh, from across arts sciences to help you understand the sorts of uh, methods and evaluations that we use across um, this field to really help inform our practice and help inform the evidence base. That will include a whole range of different methods from quantitative stuff like randomized controlled trials through to more qualitative methods, co-production methods and arts-based research methods. Then there'll be an opportunity to take two optional modules amounting to 30 credits from across UCL and here you get to draw on a whole range of different modules from across UCL's postgraduate opportunities. 
And then finally, um, a really important part of the programme is a community based research dissertation. And this is something we've been experimenting with on a smaller scale within the arts nature wellbeing module. And what we're looking to do here is work with a whole range of existing and new partners. And the way that this pro programme will work is that the community partners identify a particular problem or challenge or uh, opportunity or area of development that they wish to work with a student on. That could be, for example, an evaluation of a project. It could be helping them to develop new ways of evaluating. It could be helping them develop new programs. It could be helping them identify new audiences and reach out to those audiences. But those real world problems are defined by that community partner. And I guess that's what's really nice about it. And what you can see here, these are just some of the partners we've worked with over the past few years, a really wide range of partners that are sometimes very small community organisations, say like the Hackney Playbus, um, through to open spaces, like we work with the London Open Spaces, which includes parks and green spaces like Hampstead Heath, uh, the Trust for Conservation's Green Gym, a whole range of arts organisations like Studio Wayne McGregor, uh, the Wallace Collection, the Natural History Museum, Rosetta Life, within hospitals, our own hospitals across the road from UCL at UCH, and then a whole range of policy and um, uh, research organisations. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to gain experience across a whole range of different aspects of both research, policy and practice. And the research projects that you will do will really reflect that. I'm not going to say very much about the National Centre for Creative Health because Alex is going to tell you much more about that in detail, but one of our really key partners is the centre um, and you're, hopefully you'll get a chance to really engage with the centre as a student. We really want this to be a collaborative, co-productive relationship between this programme and the National Centre for Creative Health, so you'll hear more about that in a second. And so just to finish off, I guess a little bit of background as to why you might want to come and study a mask in creative health. Well, as well as being, uh, I guess, interested in having a postgraduate qualification, taught qualification, we think that you'll be coming because you'll be really interested in connecting up research policy and practice. So you won't just be coming and sitting in lecture theatres and listening to us talking at you. It's really going to be about that experiential experience of hearing from different people working from different sectors and getting a chance to experience the sorts of work that they're involved in. Hopefully it'll be because you're interested in a job, perhaps in health or social care, social prescribing, perhaps the arts, cultural and creative sectors or community, local government, NGOs, voluntary and third sectors. Or you're more interested in staying within research or perhaps you're interested in the interface with those. But I guess critically, you'll be interested in addressing inequalities and the role that creative health can uh, address in terms of um, approaching those wider social determinants of health. And then why UCL? Well, I guess some of you might already be at UCL, so you might know a little bit about us, um, and others may not be as familiar with UCL. UCL is a world-class university. We're ranked 10th in the world and 4th in Europe and 2nd in London. So it's a great place to come and study. And we're really lucky, I think, being in London that we have such a fantastic network of partners, both small community partners through to then much bigger, large national organisations. Just to finish off then, a few practicalities around admissions. All of this information is on our website, so please have a look there. We're asking for a, a minimum, ideally, of a 2-1 degree, a UK bachelor's degree or the overseas equivalent. And as you can see from this list on the left hand side of the slide here, we're really not being too socially prescriptive about what degree you will come with. We really want to attract people who are just genuinely interested in creative health as an opportunity for their future development. So that's why we're not being prescriptive about the degree programme that you've had. We're also interested in attracting applicants who may not have a standard undergraduate degree or equivalent, in which case we are asking that you have some equivalent academic background and work experience that is linked to creative health. So if you're in that category, what we would ask is that you please contact us and have a discussion with us about how your background might fit into that category. And that links into then uh, what you should write in your personal statement if you are applying. There's some details here, but I guess the key thing that we want to know is what are you interested, why are you interested in, in creative health and something about why your background and your motivations to apply have led you to this stage. 
Likewise, as I just said, if you're lacking any of those key criteria, we really need to see how you're drawing from your past experiences and past training that can help make up for this uh, shortfall if you don't have, for example, an undergraduate degree. And we also really want to know why you're doing it in terms of your future career ambitions and how does that fit into your application. So I hope that gives you enough of the basic structural background to the degree programme. I'm going to hand over now to Alex and she's going to tell you a little bit more about the National Centre for Creative Health and all those other great partnerships we've already talked a little bit about. And then we can move into our Q&A session. But do keep posting questions in Slido and we'll get back to you as soon as we can in relation to those questions. So, Alex, it's over to you. I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully you can start sharing. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you. Good to see everyone. I'll just share my screen um with a powerpoint and do a slideshow okay so um i am as helen says alexandra coulter and i'm director of arts and health southwest which is a learning um advocacy networking and development organization working across the southwest of england and i'm also recently appointed director of the new national center for creative health which i'm going to tell you more about um, so Helen mentioned the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being and the Creative Health Report, which really is the backbone for the work that we're doing together. And um, the all-party parliamentary group was set up in 2014 and I've provided the secretariat and project management for it on behalf of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. And before that, the National Alliance for Arts, Health and Wellbeing. So the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which Helen mentioned, is a national support organization for people working across culture with, art, with health. And it's an Arts Council England national portfolio organization. And uh, it has a very big membership, over 6,000 people now who are working in this field in one way or another large organizations working nationally, individual practitioners, small grassroots organizations. So it's a very important network for all of us to connect with. They are um, linked to LENS, the lived experience network that Helen also mentioned, uh, people who've experienced the benefits of the arts and health for their own health and well-being, and very important partners for all of us. So on behalf of the Cultural Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which itself was formed by this merger of two alliances, bringing in the arts and museums, um, I managed the Creative Health Inquiry, which went on for two years. It's a very interesting process, really fascinating for me personally, and I think for many other people, involved about 300 people from across the country coming into Parliament for round tables, which were on a whole range of themes such as dementia in the arts, devolved arts and health policy, post-traumatic stress in the arts, um, and there were 16 of them, so 16 different thematic areas. But the people around the table came from very different backgrounds, including academia, um, artists, health professionals, people with lived experience, commissioners, funders, um, decision makers. So it was a really fascinating to see groups of people who came together in a, really an interdisciplinary space. And I think that's what's so interesting about this mask is this enabling us to work in, in an interdisciplinary space and really cross over all these different sectors and challenge silos, which are often very, um, create real barriers in terms of developing work. So uh, that we also had a researcher, Dr. Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt, who was who gathered all this evidence that Helen referenced over 1000 um, examples of evidence and over 200 case studies she drew on. And the report um, reflects all of that. The report is structured by the life course. So it goes from birth to death, but that is wrapped with a sort of theoretical underpinning um, around the social determinants of health, which of course, uh, as Helen's pointed out, is absolutely central to this mask. And I would say that it's central to the work of the National Centre as we go forward as well. So the Creative Health Report had 10 recommendations and three key messages. 
And I, I read these messages now, which were um, published in 2017, and I think there are already ways that we would think differently now, I think particularly the language. So using the word the arts was, a, was really a shorthand for this whole territory. But a lot of people avoid that word now and might refer to culture and creativity. Obviously our center is called the National Center for Creative Health. I think lang language is really interesting. Um, and helps, to, helps us to define what we're actually talking about in this very complex interdisciplinary field. But it says that the arts can help keep us well, aid our recovery and support longer lives better lived. So this is really the health inequalities and social determinants territory. It can really help us at every stage in our life. It can prevent ill health. It can help, they can access to the arts and creativity and culture can help us get better. And in general, they can support um, longer lives better lived. Then the arts can help meet major challenges. Now we're all aware that health services, the funding for health, is really challenged by our current societal developments towards greater, uh, more issues with aging, long-term conditions, loneliness, mental health, all of these things which have become even more pressing as a result of the pandemic, and none of which can be solved or cured by medicine alone. Medicine is hugely important, and we don't, uh, we're never saying that it's, it, you know, that it's either or, but there's a huge amount that we need to do to support healthy lives that come, falls outside um, what medicine can achieve alone. And then the final one, the arts can help save money in the health service and social care, obviously another huge challenge and very much tied up with that previous point, because if we can work to create a society in which people are kept well and um, supported to live, live with long-term conditions without, um, deteriorating to the point where they need health services, then all of that will save money. So um, there were 10 recommendations and Helen has talked about the recommendation on education, which is a really key one. I think the recommendations intended to look at this whole field and sort of enter it at different points in the cycle of change, if you like. And education is absolutely critical in that. And it's very exciting to be connected to this mask. Um, because in a way it fast tracks this interdisciplinary space. Uh, if you think we actually, the recommendation was to medical schools and art schools and thinking about how they might interrelate and how they might incorporate um, mod modules from either health or arts in, the, in their own courses. But it's, it's really interesting to think about how we might create a whole new space between those two worlds. Um, and then obviously recommendation one was for the National Centre, a strategic centre. And this, the centre was made into a charity, registered as a charity last July and launched very recently on the 9th of March. And the mission is that we will advance good practice and research. I can't quite see my mission with the picture here. Inform policy and promote collaboration, helping foster the conditions for creative health to be integral to health and social care and wider systems. I'm very glad that Helen has defined this term creative health, which I think isn't necessarily easily defined, but this notion of creating the conditions in which this kind of work can flourish. I think is, is a really key ambition for us. And that involves um, working within health and social care uh, to enable people working in those disciplines and those areas to be more receptive to um, arts-based approaches. So in terms of what we're actually going to do, we have these hubs, which we call systems and places, and they refer to a project really with NHS England and integrated care systems, which you may be aware of, uh, which are a new structure, which bring together local authorities, NHS, public health, voluntary community sector in 43 different geographic areas across England. So we're looking at places like in, as in these four listed here, where there's been really good practice and they are embedding creative approaches in their systems, looking at what they're doing, how they're doing it, what the barriers to that were, uh, how it's funded and learning from that to spread that learning across the whole um, network of integrated care systems. And then we are uh, working with colleagues in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales who have devolved systems, so different, um, different ways of doing health and arts actually to learn from each other. Then the hives, which are a more, is more of a um, catch-all for partnerships and collaborations, specifically working with academic health science networks and centers 
Um, they have a remit around innovation and spread, but more around technology and science. So how can creative approaches to health be integrated into their thinking and how can we use some of their spread mechanisms to support the work? So that's in Manchester and London at the moment and then national networks and institutions such as the Cultural Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which I've always met, already mentioned, and Care England and the National Academy for Social Prescribing. Lots and lots to understand in all of this, but this is just a sense of, um, of where we're starting. And then finally, huddles, which are opportunities for learning in small numbers, either residentials or workplace learning, which is with people with lived experience, co-production and creativity, exploring new ways of thinking and then taking that learning back into the systems. So I'm not, I won't talk about the research side of it because that's very much um, Helen's territory, just to say that the centre does have these relationships. The primary relationship is with UCL and with this masters, but um, also with other research groups and centres around the country. And we want to work collaboratively with academic centres to ensure that evidence, policy and practice are genuinely interlinked and that we can make progress on this um, agenda around creative health approaches becoming integral to health and social care and wider systems. Thanks, Helen. I hope that's our stop share. Hope that's OK. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. What a fantastic whistle stop tour through all the amazing work that you have, have really been fundamental to pushing forward. So thank you for taking the time to join us. So guys, now we're moving over to um, you, hear from you and um, hopefully you've been posting questions for us and Thomas is going to be posting those and helping us to answer those. Uh, so please keep posting your questions and voting them up and over to you, Thomas, and we'll do our best to uh, answer as many as we can. Yeah, thank, thanks, Helen. Um, so there are two questions who are very popular. Most of the other ones haven't received, uh, have only received one vote or none, but I uh, will go for those two and then, then we'll see. But in the meantime, if, if anybody would like to take a look at the questions already in the list and see if there are any ones that you find particularly relevant, then please do vote them up. Um, this will help us then getting through the questions that you find most interesting. Um, and, and the one that's, that's on the top is how long will it take to hear back after submitting an application? <laughs> uh, and and we were talking about this before and, and Helen suggested as admissions tutor, I should probably take that one. <laughs> um, so I, I can just, it's, it's quite difficult for us to say actually, because the process is that you submit centrally to UCL's uh, admissions office and then they have some checks to do. Uh, and so that will probably take a week or two, but they, they check your application, make sure you're eligible in, in theory, and then pass it on to us. And then we need to make a decision based on on your actual application, the the, the statement and the um, the reference letters and so on. And, and obviously your, your undergraduate grades, if, if, if you come from the, the, the more streamlined BA route rather than the alternative route that Helen spoke about. And then when we decide to make an offer, it goes back to the admissions office and they need to contact you. So I, I think the process can probably take up to a month or so, um, give take. Uh, just as an example, we've received a few applications already after our launch event in early February. So about about the middle of February, and we've made, I think, three or four offers based based on those applications. And the applicants are probably about to hear back in the next week or so. So it takes takes a bit of time, but there, the, it's, it's we are we are processing them on, on a rolling basis, so to speak. So if you're ready to apply, please apply. If you have queries about it. Um, do do contact us and and we can arrange even a, a meeting like like so via Zoom if that's helpful to address specific questions. But uh, yeah, don't 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 sit on them for too long. I guess get 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 applying at least thinking thinking about it. Um, and and don't be surprised if you um, don't hear back straight away because there is that slightly complicated process. Um, I, ho I hope that helps. Um, and uh, the next question again, that's very a very simple one to answer. So I'll just take that myself as well. Is does the application process include an interview? And and that's uh, simply a no. We, we are basing our decisions based on your statement in the first instance, and all, obviously also on your profile, and uh, and the references to some degree. But it's primarily really about the statement and how how you've been um, how you've been supporting your your. Um, 
your application with uh, what you'd like to do on 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 the mask when you take it and and with with that that learning that you have uh, done with us um, afterwards, if if that makes sense. Okay, um, so um, feel free to upload other questions. In the meantime, I shall uh, take some some questions um, that are. Uh, that have got a few votes. There's one that's pretty good. I think I can put that both to Helen and to Alex is working in museums and hospitals, etc. may be affected um, if the current restrictions continue or are re reintroduced um, come next academic year. Um, so, so how will the, the teaching, how will the, the module be affected if, if we still have some limitations on social distancing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it really, I would say the answer to that would say it really depends on the partner that we would be working with. So some of the partners that we've worked with are, have still worked as normal. You know, obviously the hospitals have been open and they've um, we've worked with them in slightly different ways in slightly different venues in some circumstances. Uh, one of the sessions we run is a green gym. So we're outside in a park. So we still do those sessions. Um, so I think we would, um, we obviously all hope that we are going to be able to go ahead with weekly sessions like that. It's such an important part of the programme. Um, obviously, none of us know what will happen in terms of future restrictions and how that will affect organisations like arts, culture organisations, museums, libraries, etc. Uh, nobody, unfortunately, knows the answer to that. And I think they would all love to know that. What I would say is that a big part of our work, certainly a big research project that we're leading here at UCL actually is very much about how has the arts, creative and community sector responded to the pandemic. Um, and uh, I can put a web link to it in the chat if people are interested, it's called Community COVID. And, you know, it's been really astonishing the, the arts and creative sector, how they've responded to the pandemic. So if you're not familiar with some of that work of what they've done, it's really phenomenal. Um, if you go to the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance web pages, again, I can put this uh, in the chat. Um, they've got uh, a whole load of resources and links to other organisations to what they how they've responded to the pandemic. Uh, similarly, one of our allied projects, uh, another one of our research projects that I'm involved in called the March Mental Health Research Network. Uh, we've been collating resources there. I mean, it's really phenomenal how um, the arts and community sector has responded. And Alex might want to give some examples just of the sorts of work they've been doing. But, you know, it really is amazing what the arts and cultural sector have done to respond. A lot of it has been online, but also really interesting offline offers, you know, doorstep performances of, of singing, arts, poetry, um, dance, um, uh, working with many new different partners. Uh, like food banks, risk, risk registers. So it's been really fantastic, I think, to, to see the response from the sector. So I think even if absolutely worst case, we're facing still restrictions, I don't think this will limit the work that we can do in the master's programme. Um, I think it will make it even more interesting because you know we'll be able to get involved in, in all of that work, uh, both on the practice side and the policy side, because we're doing some interesting work with people like Department of Culture, Media and Sport, who are responsible for the cultural recovery. So I'm working with Neil Mendoza and others and thinking about that. And so I, this is a really exciting time, I think, uh, albeit very challenging for the arts sector. But Alex, maybe you could give some examples of the sorts of stuff you've been doing in Arts Health Southwest. Well, I mean, I think I just um, concur with what you're saying that actually, in a way, this is super interesting time for this sector um, because a lot of, especially the more grassroots organizations perhaps have been able to respond. That's, that's characteristic of them that they are quite fleet of foot and adaptable. Obviously, you'll all know from the news and we all know that some of the big institutions, the venues, the museums, the theaters and so on are really struggling, but even those, their work in health is often not venue based. It's all about partnership working and they have been able to continue in one way or another. <coughs> and I think there are hugely interesting challenges around digital poverty, which links into health inequalities, how the arts and cultural and other community um, organizations have responded to that, what's going on around you know, connecting with people, keeping people connected. In terms of the Southwest and examples, um, there has been a fantastic amount of work, uh, people working with food banks. I mean, really, I'm just saying what Helen's already said, um, some really lovely stuff outside, outside care homes. Um, and it's just so rich, despite everything, I think, um, 
I think it's been extraordinary and the energy and the, the desire to help has been quite magnificent actually. So yes, I just agree with everything you said, Helen. <laughs> Perfect. And I've just put all those links uh, to our research project. There are obviously many other research projects, but um, we've been really lucky to work with a whole range of national organizations like Arts Council, the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, Voluntary Arts, Natural England, the, the NHS Personalised Care and the NASP, National Academy for Social Prescribing. And that's really helped us sort of link into different ways of connecting both with providers, whether it's a museum or a library or an artist um, or a park um, uh, and their participants to, to help us understand yeah, that, that practice. Uh, and then the coronavirus resources uh, web pages that I mentioned. So I hope that's of interest. Okay. Um, a question again, hopefully the two of you can uh, can say something about, which is about the NHS. And as the National Health Service is restructured and clinical commissioning groups disappear, does the course address service commissioning pathways? Yeah, well, very much so. I mean, Alex has already mentioned kind of interest and opportunities around integrated care systems. Um, so I guess how we'll be interfacing with that is, you know, it's not a programme about learning about NHS systems. I think that could be very dull. Um, and it's going to be really about understanding, I guess, how organisations, practitioners, policy interfaces with those different health systems. And as you may know, any of you who are already working in or interface with health or social care, it's very complicated. And it's also very different locally and regionally as to how it's mapped out in terms of the NHS Trust, the PCTs or primary care networks, um, and also how that's going to change in terms of the integrated care system. So what we hope through the course is that you will build up your knowledge and awareness of that, not by having loads of dull and dry lectures with flow charts of what happens through a referral pathway, which looks different for every type of referral, even within social prescribing, you know, just today, in fact, on one of my other research projects, we've been collating what are called social prescribing ecosystems, so what that referral pathway looks like completely different across every area. It varies from GPs to GPs, it varies from primary care trust and networks uh, to another one. And so it's these things are, are not set in stone, but I think what you will get is a really good understanding of the diversity and the complexity of those systems. But more importantly, I think, of how we can uh, think about the development of what Alex and I are calling creative health partnerships. And that's uh, really what's great about the links with the NCCH. Alex, do you want to add to that in, in terms of the work that you're doing, perhaps specifically around the ICSs? Yes, I mean, I think in a way I am quite interested in systems. It obviously could be very dry, but I think it is fascinating territory and some of the work we're doing with the hubs, which is the work with integrated care systems, is very much about this. So CCGs are going, how does the money flow work? How And this notion, which both Helen and I use about how do you create the conditions for this work to develop and flourish is, is dependent on some of the systems issues and care path ways and the spread from prevention through to acute sector so I think it is very fascinating territory and very complex and I think um, it, it will be part of what you learn I'm quite sure because all of the work going on has to deal with that and people deal with it in some cases better than others because it is it is very difficult but um, yes it's it's pretty central I would say. And I guess I noticed that Angie has put a comment in, in the um, chat. Um, do please put your questions in the Slido. But just to address that, I guess, you know, as a link worker, and, and we work a lot with link workers, you know, uh, we know that navigating the system from your perspective is also not always that easy. And, and so what we really hope is that we can all, I guess, learn together in understanding, you know, what are the best ways into that system? You know, social prescribing really relies on that connectivity between the kind of health or social care referrer and those community providers. And we know that that, it, that ecosystem, as I said, is already very complicated. Um, but the great thing is that, you know, the work that we're doing with organisations like the National Academy for Social Prescribing, as Alex mentioned, and the NHS Personalised Care colleagues, you know, that they uh, really, I think, want to uh, work and help understand how to make that system more effective and more efficacious for people, particularly around health inequalities. 
So, you know, the fact that it's so complicated, uh, you know, it could be a challenge, but I think it could also be an opportunity, again, on the course to think about what some of those challenges are, and particularly through the links with the work that the NCCH are doing. So I hope that addresses your question. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, there are two that we hopefully can deal with relatively quickly. Uh, and then there, there's some more meaty ones. Uh, the first one, is it the course covered by UK student loans? And the answer is yes, um, at least in theory. It depends obviously on if you have received the loan before and, and to what degree. I can put the link to the UCL student finance in the chat for everyone. So that, And there is also, um, I think, some contact details if you want to discuss your personal situation with them. Um, we obviously, uh, at, in, at departmental level, we have nothing to do with that end of things, but there are people in UCL who can advise you on this, so please, please contact those. Uh, and, and the next one, how many contact days uh, per week uh, would be required if somebody's doing the, the course part-time, the, take, taking the, the program part-time? And Essentially, it depends how you split your credits. That's something we need to work out with, with everybody individually on their situation, I think. I don't know if Helen has, has something else. There are some modules that we say need to be taken in the first year, like the research methods and arts, nature, and well-being. And the dissertation obviously then needs to be taken largely in the second year, although you can start it um, part-time in, in the first year. But it's essentially... You know, the idea is that you, you study, if you study full time, it's like a, a week's work. So you, you spend 40, 50 hours a week, hope, you know, um, thereabouts. So part time would probably be half of that. But I don't know if Helen has, a, has another perspective on that. Well, I, do, I guess just to say, Thomas, that we, what we've agreed is that we're very conscious that obviously people who are joining us part time would be almost certainly working as well. So what we would plan to do is to um, compress. Uh, particular modules into one or two days so that you would always know what days uh, you would be uh, working on. So we will arrange it so that all part-time students are in at the same time, along with obviously the full-time students will be there as well, um, but that so you would know exactly what days you would, you would um, be available and or not available so that you could hopefully fit it around existing work commitments. I hope that answers your yeah. question. Good point. Thanks, Helen. Um, uh, this one, I know there was a brief discussion about this in the in the chat, but um, I think this is a relevant one to 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 raise here as well. And this is how can this degree benefit a mid career health professional? Yeah, I, I think I did uh, address your question. Hopefully, um, Lucia. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, we're very conscious that we, we, we're very keen to attract actually people from very different backgrounds and, and perhaps, you know, people who've already been working in either health or art sectors and have an interest in creative health. So it, whilst we, of course, need to make the course available and accessible for really everybody from, from whatever background you've come, if you're coming straight from a degree, um, we're also very conscious that you may come we hope with your own practical experiences and knowledge bases. Uh, we've talked a lot about co-production and that applies to the students as well. You know, it's very much about drawing on your own experiences um, and that can include, for example, where you've got existing links. And I know somebody's put in a, a question about, for example, uh, interest in working with, uh, interfacing with local authorities where they already work or are involved with. And we very much encourage that. Uh, and some of you may be already Im embedded within organizations where you really want to make the link between the learning you might do in a master's program and the work that you're doing. And we would really encourage that. So that can be integrated certainly through the community research project, for example, um, as long as all parties agree to that and, and your employer and all the organization you already work with are happy for that. We obviously have certain guidelines and criteria that we need to follow in terms of ensuring that it is uh, meeting a certain standard of research, um, but that is very much encouraged. So I hope that sort of addresses both of your questions, uh, uh, Lucia and Elizabeth, but um, we, we do very much welcome and encourage people to come who've already been working in those professional backgrounds. Um, and the way that we have structured the programme is that you, you're getting all these very different perspectives, but it's very much uh, modular in that you can draw on this wider learning both from each other, but all of these different sector professionals that we're bringing up, um, as well as then the scaffolding, if you like, around say research methods 
Um, and again, somebody may come with a much more, for example, quantitative background, um, or conversely, you know, you may have come much more from an arts background and never experienced, you know, what it's like to, to run an RCT. We won't be running RCTs, but you will hopefully go away with a better understanding of what an RCT is, um, what, what randomised control data looks like, what controlling for variables looks like, what effect sizes are. Um, so it, it's really that, that the sort of plethora, if you like, of that research policy and practice. Uh, and so hopefully you can engage in the course in that way, drawing from it what uh, most uh, and best supports you. Great, thank you. Um, again, there are a couple that we can hopefully answer quite quickly. Um, do you think uh, of an online version of this master's to include more overseas students, maybe for the second year? So would we provide an online only version? And I, I guess the answer in the, in the very short term is probably not very likely um, because uh, again, this running an online course is very labor intensive as, as well. And we don't have the additional staffing capacity to run two courses in parallel. Um, maybe this, and UCL is also not an online education provider. And it's been very clear that as soon as physical face-to-face -face education is possible again, um, we will go back into that mode. Uh, there are obviously online courses by, by other, institutions but not not on this field yet I'm, I'm afraid i don't know if helen has something else to yeah, say on this it's a really good question we've been having a lot of inquiries about that i mean you know the short answer is we're very keen to do it but as thomas says you know um ucl is not really set up you know we have aspects of ucl that are, are really set up to deliver online learning um, and we are in conversations with other other programs master's programs that do deliver their modules um, as a distance module as an online module and um, so it's something we would really like to do in the future but in the next sort of, I guess, year, two years, three years, it's not very likely. It, it requires actually a lot of different ways of developing a programme, particularly like this, that is very experiential. Um, so in the future, we really hope so, but at the minute, not in the, in the very near future. Sorry. We've definitely gained some experience in how to do certain things online in, in, in the past 12 months, but but it's not the same as doing a, a, as running it as an online programme, I, th I think. Um, and another overseas related question is whether funding is available to non-UK residents and not through the, the, the student loan book, I'm afraid. And we are working very hard at the moment on finding uh, finance options in terms of uh, potential scholarships and so on. But sadly, they won't be in place for this first year of running it. But hopefully in the future, this is definitely one thing we, we would like to do is be able to offer at least a small number of scholarships that then students can apply for either on a means basis or on a, on a competitive basis by, by you know, um, write, writing, a, um, writing an essay or something like that. So, but we haven't worked that entirely out and we haven't found the, the benevolent funders yet, but this is, this is in the pipeline, but I'm afraid not for the coming academic year. Um, okay, this next one is a bit more meaty um, for, for Alex and, and Helen. What are the philosophical perspectives that the course is taught from? Wow. <laughs> that, is, that is a meaty one. Um, I guess, um, well, the, the main sort of philosophical underpinning, if, if you can call it a philosophical underpinning that I've always worked from is, is the notion of salutogenesis and positive psychology. Um, those are the sorts of theoretical frameworks that we draw upon a lot in our research and I've certainly in practice seen a lot of people drawing from those sorts of models so those essentially a more holistic uh, notion of being. Um, I think a lot of the practice also reflects that you know I mean we're, we're all becoming familiar with things like forest bathing now and forest bathing as you know is increasingly being rolled out as a green social prescription as a nature-based social prescription and there's a lot of different I think underpinning, philo underpinning philosophies and theories that we're really interested in drawing upon um, so some of that will be covered in in the module um, in the module art nature well-being but I think also just from the wider reading from from the course hopefully you'll get a sense of what those sorts of underpinning theories are similarly you know we've got the, our module coming on on approaches to interdisciplinarity and that's really where I think where you'll get more of the philosophy um, unfortunately our program lead for that particular module isn't able to join us today but um, there will be more information soon coming about that particular module. So sorry, that's a bit of a woolly, a woolly answer, but Alex might have something she wants to add to that. 
I think my, my answer is even more woolly, which is I'd like to find out more about the philosophical underpinnings. I mean, I find it all fascinating, but I'm not an academic. And I just think it is this interdisciplinary space that is existential, I can see in the chat. It is, um, inter <laughs> the interdisciplinarity is what really intrigues me. I'm, I like stuff that has that process and creation element to it. I think it's about creativity, but I don't think that's an underpinning philosophy. I'm not sure. So could be if you look to Buddhism. That's a whole <laughs> other a whole other a whole other discussion for them. Okay. Um how does the course intend to cover gender disparities in the healthcare outcomes? One S data suggests health inequalities are growing. Yeah, well, and I, and I guess, you know, it, it really depends where you're coming from. But so, for example, if you look at um, health inequalities data um, from a lot of data sets, women, for example, outside of London, interestingly, are, are kind of worst at risk. Um, so it really depends, I think, what data you look at. Um, I think where we will be, I guess, most interested and most focused on it is, I guess, drawing on that data and evidence that really shows us what we mean by the social determinants of health and what these, particularly around what Marmot has talked about, these regional disparities, which we're only really just starting to, um, I think, have a get to grips with now. So Marmot has talked about these for, for a long time, but I think over the past few years, we're really having a lot better understanding of these sorts of re regional disparities. Uh, they do link to gender disparities, but also many other disparities across society. So we know, for example, about BAME communities being more affected by COVID. Um, that, that's not at all a surprise for anybody who works around health inequalities, because those are the communities that are already facing, they're living in the poorest areas, they're first facing the worst health outcomes, they're facing highest levels of deprivation. Um, and all the, the pandemic has done is really highlight those inequalities. So I think definitely, um, we, we will be looking at the, that sort of data and evidence. And then really importantly, I'm thinking, uh, what I guess Alex and I are most interested in is, you know, how can these more creative health approaches work to support those individuals and communities better? Um, and that needs, you know, wide scale systems change. Um, and, you know, that's really, I guess, one of our driving forces also, Alex, in terms of setting up the National Centre for Creative Health. How can we push those agendas nationally? you know, asking the NHS to refocus and just work on health inequalities uh, might seem like a good idea, but putting it into practice is very, very challenging. Same across arts and culture, you know, arts and culture is currently not funded with its primary objective of tackling inequalities. I would argue perhaps it should be, but then I might get shot down by Arts Council. <laughs> I'd just like to add, I just think this is such important work and it's very easy to say we're going to focus on health inequalities, I speak for myself here, and we have to be so rigorous in really thinking about that and really trying to grasp how we can make positive change happen, because as as we all know, it's getting worse, not better. And we're not in control of all those factors, but we can contribute to that. And we can be collectively, we can really push this agenda. So I think it's just really important to keep it center, center stage. Good question. Okay, um, we should have time for a few more, hopefully. Uh, there's one, is there a placement element to this course, um, which I, I can start and then maybe Helen wants, wants to add as well which is essentially that 90 credits or so half of your course is the research dissertation and the dissertation is entire is going to be entirely based as part of a project with a community partner organization or partner organization it, we can't call it a placement for legal reasons but essentially that's what it is you're, you're doing research in collaboration with a with a partner organization i hope that that kind of answered us that question so it's 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 worth half the the whole, the whole uh, masters essentially is a placement element. I don't know, Helen, would you like to add to this or? No, I mean, uh, hopefully that addresses the question, but it is a really um, important part of the program, I think, because it's, it's really applying that, the research and the learning that you've, you've, you've acquired and your own experiences to then working with that community organization. So it is like a placement, but as Thomas says, we're not allowed to call it that. You didn't hear that, Christy. Right. Um, there's one again, both for maybe Alex and you, Helen. Uh, thinking about job opportunities post-graduation, are there any areas in the sector you expect to grow more so than others? 
Yeah, really good question. I mean, the answer is yes, we hope lots of areas. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess around really all those sectors is where we need to see more posts, you know, whether it's creative health coordinators, um, well-being officers, um, people who understand the interface between these sectors. Um, we're obviously seeing that with a rise in, in social prescribing link workers. Um, I know we have a, a link worker on the call if she's still with us. Um, and there are opportunities around those. Those are growth areas. Oh, but, I hello. <laughs> um, and these are growth areas. That's great. But um, those individuals, and perhaps Angie can say something about this, those individuals, you know, are interested very much in training and support. And uh, even if they're not able to come and do master's programmes, you know, we're linking up with the National Academy for Social Prescribing, as Alex said. Um, I've been working uh, with a whole series of link workers around particular research projects, and that uh, comes out a lot is the interest around training and support in that area. I think the other area we've seen a big rise is across um, the arts and cultural sector. Um, I come from museums, so I can talk about that, and then perhaps Alex can talk about um, her sectors. But, you know, in museums 10 years ago, people were not uh, really doing this work at all. Now we've seen a whole rise uh, in museums. Uh, shifting posts, you know, perhaps from posts that were geared towards education and schools to being much more communities focused. Sometimes that involves job title changes. Uh, you know, those post holders then become well-being coordinators um, and are often are very focused on delivering and developing well-being programs. But Alex, you've, you've also got lots of experience from the, from the wider arts and creative sector. Yes, I mean, I'd just like to say that in a way, um, we're working with an ecosystem that is growing for sure. And really uh, there's a huge amount of interest, but there isn't a clear um, linear path from doing this kind of course into a clear career path at the moment. In a sense, we're all responsible for trying to create that because we know the demand is growing and we know the opportunities are growing, but we don't yet have um, the structures that make that pathway clear. So I don't think we, well, I mean, I, I don't think we can claim there is uh, obvious jobs at the end, but there certainly is growth in the area. And I was just, I just sort of listed some things to think about this. You know, there are a lot of networks, there are jobs within networks, there are administrative jobs, there are management jobs. There's a whole area around learning you're obviously, this is about a course in higher education, but as Helen said, there is a huge demand for training and development in the workplace and artists, as well as in health section sectors. Facilitation, the actual facilitation of activities, project management, and then obviously research and evaluation is hugely important. And the various places, you know, just even to say a few of them are hospitals. There's a lot of work going on in hospitals, social prescribing um, in community organizations, as Helen said, in arts organizations, in museums. So there are lots of different places where this work is developing. And I'd agree with what Helen was saying about museums. The arts sector is, is noticing it. It's now in the Arts Council 10 year strategy that health and well-being is a kind of main focus. So even major arts organizations are turning to consider this territory and to understand it better. So there will be jobs in, in the main institutions as well, I think. One question has, has bounced up a bit, uh, as, which is a direct follow on to this, I think, and that's, is it possible to go straight into policy work after this course, working in government departments, for example? Yeah, well, I, I think, again, you know, like Alex says, because it's a growth area, we're also seeing a lot of interest um, from, for example, different government offices, different policy organisations, think tanks, you know, coming to us and asking about uh, this, this new area, although it's not necessarily new to us, it, it is new to many uh, individuals. And, for example, I gave a talk last week at the Department of Health and Social Care and lots of people who were just not really familiar so they might be working on communities but really not familiar with concepts like social prescribing or the practice of social prescribing that you know how much work is really going on across arts um, nature already and, and you know how much more demand there has been for those sorts of community-based approaches so definitely I think within 
government departments um, and within local authorities, I think, as again, increased understanding um, of this sort of, you know, interdisciplinary way, way of working. Um, you know, we work with different people in, in, you know, the parks and leisure departments and we're working uh, through the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance with organisations like the Local Governments Association, increasingly interested, you know, in that very communities focused of what kind of people are doing what jobs in what areas. Um, a lot of it tends to be people from, you know, the arts and cultural or the tourism departments, but like I say, you know, colleagues contacting us from housing departments or the risk registers. So I think as people become more aware of the work and as the, you know, as we, we hear more and more about social prescribing and the rise of social prescribing referrals, referrals happen, I think we will start getting increased awareness across these wider policy sectors. And then those organisations, as Alex says, thinking about um, what that means for them as an organisation and, and hopefully, you know, changing their practice and then reflecting that in job opportunities. Hey, thank you. I think we have almost out of time. We have a minute left. So maybe there's just there are two that I can take very quickly uh, and then we might have to leave it there and, and respond to the remaining ones. There are three or four still there in the FAQs and frequently asked questions on our mask creative health page. So do keep an eye on that. We'll respond to, to those questions in writing. But one is very simple. How many applications will we accept this year? And that's very simple. We will have 25 places available. Um, and that, that's in, in plan to grow over the next few years on a year-on-year -year basis. But for now, it's 25 for the coming September. And then there's one from somebody interested in a PhD and at what stage sh should they apply? So um, I presume that means apply for the PhD program rather than the master's. If, if you have already a master's and you'd like to do a PhD in the field of creative health, then I, I can just say, come and talk to us. Drop us a line. We are very interested in... In, in developing and finding more opportunities, also to find funding opportunities to fund PhD positions. So please come and talk to us if, if you already uh, passed the, the master stage. But I guess it's six o'clock now, so we should probably leave it there. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Helen. Um, and thanks everybody who, who came along and just stuck it out till the end. Um, We've recorded this session, so I'm sure Christy will send around an email with the recording, with a link to the recording, and also then a link to the frequently asked questions section on the on the mask website. And if there are any follow up questions you have, please do get back in touch with us. Um, very happy to um, to respond, or if if relevant, if useful, then even arrange a meeting in person. Thank you so much, Helen. Would you like to? Uh, Thanks everybody, and thank you, Alex. Please go to your Pilates class; it's very important. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Right. And Bye. thanks everyone for joining us. Bye. Bye. Thanks.